works hard to open it. Thank you very much. marketing company and then uh, after that I worked for South African tourism for some few years in New York and then I decided to come back home I've worked for the likes of Pro Tours I've worked for SARS I've worked for Rennes Travel as one of their directors and uh, I've worked for Fedhasa which is the hotel association and ultimately at the tourism business council of South Africa so I'm not new I've, I've been around for a little bit. Uh, I learned from yourselves. I learned by observing, by watching what you do, and uh, you know, trying to make sure that we, you know, we better the industry and we are able to prosper. So you can imagine that uh, you know, in an exception of airlines and perhaps car rentals, you know, I've been around, you know, many different aspects of tourism. And I know what it feels to be a receptionist. I know what it feels to be filing. I know what it feels, you know, to be a sales manager and be responsible for sales. I know how it feels uh, to do account management and making sure that you don't lose those accounts. Um, so I've done a bit of everything. So some of you are familiar faces. I may not remember where. You know, like Chad. <laughs> 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 So I may not remember where, but uh, you know we go a long way. It is indeed a tough time for our industry. Um, you know, last year when we finished 2019, uh, it wasn't the greatest year for both inbound and uh, domestic travel. Uh, some of you may have done well, but overall we never did that well. In essence, uh, we sort of regressed from how we did in 2018 and how we did in 2017. And you will remember that when we were dealing uh, in 2018-17, we were dealing with issues around unabridged based certificates. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of people that were not considering South Africa uh, because of uh, the confusion, they didn't know what to do, and they opted for other destinations, i.e. East Africa. If you talk to a lot of tour operators overseas, they will tell you that there is a lot more demand for East Africa even now and demand for South Africa, which is a sad story because we've been the leaders in this space and we have been doing well for quite some time. 
But be that it may, uh, I started at the Tourism Business Council of South Africa two years ago. And two years ago, we had an issue of unabridged based certification. And the first thing to do was to sort it out once and for all. Uh, and I've worked with many people that are found in the industry. Uh, well, the likes of David Frost, we've been working together since 2015, Otto de Vries, and many others that have been you know, party to these discussions, that have been fighting this fight. But we had to solve it once and for all. And we were able to sort out the issue around Arabic that certificate for inbound travelers. There is still a work that needs to be done for outbound South Africans, you know, who are traveling with families. And we are still going to deal with that. Uh, the destruction now is the situation that we have at hand. But nonetheless, we haven't forgotten about those legacy issues that we still need to, to deal with, including your NPTR and many other issues that are hindering tourism growth. Now, after we sort out the Anna Brinkman certificate, we thought we were going to come back, especially for, you know, family travel. You know, I remember sitting in London, uh, being frustrated, talking to different uh, tour operators and travel agents, and I said to them, look, I'm going to go outside and try to see if we can solve this thing, because I'm just tired of hearing people saying that we can't take families to South Africa. They can't bring school groups to South Africa because of the complexities that we had at that time. And lucky enough, you know, the work that we put in and the negotiations that we put in enable us to, to open the inbound part. Although, as I've said, we still need to go with the outbound part. Now, finish 2019, you know, we're all optimistic. We thought 2020 was going to be a great year. And uh, I, I, I spoke to many, you know, tour operators, many travel agents, many hotels that thought, you know what, we're going to improve from what we did in 2019. And plans were in place. You put in plans, your staff put in plans, your bosses put in plans, and it was time to really come back as Destination South Africa for both domestic and inbound travel to make sure that you know we get more people employed, impact the economy, and we make sure that you know we shine uh, you know, within the Southern Africa space and the Africa space in general. And as you all know, December, there was a talk about this COVID. Then it was coronavirus, somewhere in China. And we all thought, you know what, we've seen this. You know, we saw, you know, some few other things. This thing is going to be managed. It's not going to reach us. Oh, then it moved to Europe. Then we suddenly said, mm, maybe Europe will manage it. Maybe we're not going to get Africa, maybe spared. And we're all optimistic. And then we got the first case in South Africa. We were still optimistic. We got this thing. We can manage it. It's only a few people. And um, then the community transmission started. This is when, you know, the reality start to sink in, that uh, this thing is moving fast. It's moving around many different countries. It's coming here in South Africa. And we are in this together. I don't think at that time, as a travel industry, we were opposed to taking measures that will, you know, as they say it at that time, flatten the curve. So we're all optimistic that if we took a measure that's going to be short term, you know, it may indeed flatten the curve. And I remember talking to some of the uh, of my colleagues. They were saying, well, you know, if we have to go through shutdown for I think the initial lockdown was three weeks, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. We all were optimistic that you know what, if we were to sacrifice three weeks. And then we've gone back to what we're supposed to do. You know, it should be fine, provided it's implemented properly. And it is one of those measures that will bring the results that we desire. And um, we all know what happened. Three weeks down the line, um, the government introduced the risk-adjusted strategy. And there were scenarios. And they were not good for tourism. And as an industry, you know, we sat down. I remember we had a board meeting right after the introduction of risk adjustment strategy and various levels of lockdown. And then we we'll realized after the scenarios were put in on the table that uh, we're in this for quite a long time. And this may take us a year, you know, to operate. So what do you do when you're in that situation? You know, you put on your gear, 
uh, you start to say, well, you know, we all work in this industry. We have 1.5 million people that are supported by tourism. We impact the economy by 8.6%. We buy 12.5% of locally manufactured vehicles. We impact the retail sector by 8.6%. We touch agriculture, we touch the banking service, we touch all these other aspects that may not be directly tourism, but they are dependent on us because we bring money for them. You know, how many egg farmers, you know, uh, you know produce eggs for our industry? We, we, pro we, we, we consume, you know, around 30 million eggs. You know, per year, if not more. So, if you're a farmer, you're sitting, you know, with the, you know, the eggs at home or at the farm. What are you gonna do with those eggs? If you're a farmer and you're producing spinach or any other vegetables, you know, that are designated for specific hotels, what do you do? If you are an agri processor, you know, that's cutting fruits, you know, for various hotel groups, what do you do? Your lifeline gets cut immediately. So we had to come up with a plan. And the plan was that uh, we were not going to accept the fact that we were going to open international inbound in February 2021. That's number one. We're not going to accept that. And we said we're not going to accept that domestic travel you know, is going to only start in November. We said we're not going to accept that. So we had to work to reverse the projections that were put in front of us. Nevertheless, those projections were not even done with our consultation. So we had to, you know, rework ourselves backwards to say, you know, how do we now fight with government and negotiate with government at the same time? Because when you talk to government, uh, it's not a one-way talk. You know, you can write them a letter. Yeah, well, you like if they respond. Um, you can go and put a motivation or whatever you put in. Yeah, they'll look at it. You can go to the media and talk to them. Yeah, that's going to put pressure on them if they look bad and they're going to want to come back and try to fix it. You can also talk to them through legal action. You know, it's, it's, those are the three ways that you can get government, you know, to sort of, uh, you know, look at your matter. And also you can lobby different, uh, you know, uh, ministers to see things your way before you present what you want to present uh, to government. Now, when the risk adjustment strategy was introduced, yes, I could uh, see, you know, across the industry that uh, no one was happy. South African tourism did scenario planning and it wasn't good for us. It wasn't acceptable. Um, and then we sat down and said, how do we move things faster? This is where the war started, let me put it that way. But this is a war with many different battles you know, along the way, where you know it's, it's a long-term thing. You kind of think that because you won one battle today, it's, it's, it's over. You win one, you put it aside, you sleep, you wake up in the morning, you start the next one. So we said, number one, one of the things that's going to make us go back to operation is that we develop industry protocols. So we sat down with the association, we developed industry protocols to make sure that the protocols covers the value chain of tourism. Every aspect of tourism is accounted for when we deal with these protocols. So that was one tool to convince government that you know we're doing something about the mitigation uh, of, of the spread of this COVID-19. Number two was to make sure that we lobby all the ministers, including the president himself. So we put together a team, uh, not going to mention names, of uh, heavyweights from various industries. Uh, people that are respected, that have chaired the board of uh, ESCOM uh, and many other boards. Uh, that, you know, when you go to the president and you say, well, these are the people I'm bringing, no one is going to say no. So we put them together, put a team, about six, seven people, uh, and um, we managed to get one of them to call the president and say we want to have a meeting. And the president agreed that we're going to have a meeting. And uh, we then prepare for the meeting. Um, this was the time when we were on level four, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, the president agreed to meet with us. We start to talk about concessions. What is it? 
the give and take. What is it that we're willing to do and what is it that you know we want to get back from government? We started with domestic tourism. And you would have seen that you know when the president started to talk, I think when he was introducing some of these levels, he started to start talking tourism, tourism, tourism. That was after the meeting that we had with him. We really pleading with the president to say if we continue to shut down the industry, there will be nothing left to open to in 2021. We will not have one single company saying, and we need to do something about it. We had to teach government what tourism is, you know, how it touches various aspects of the economy, what is the importance, and why do we want it to open. And I must say, when we went there, we got a positive response uh, from the president himself. Uh, but we had to go further. You know, as you know, there's cabinet, you need to convince the ministers. Then after the ministers, you've got to convince the DGs. So there's a whole hierarchy that you need to work through. And sometimes information doesn't move from one level to the next. And you've got to be patient enough, you know, to figure out ways to move information around. So be that it may, we managed to, you know, fast track the opening of domestic tourism, you know, much sooner. However, that came with a lot of conditions. Uh, you can only travel within Kaupen. But when you live in Kaupen, you know, where are you going to go? <laughs> and around 67% of domestic travelers live in Kaupen. So literally, you're not opening anything. <laughs> you, you're saying everyone sick where you are. Because it, it's okay to say someone who lives in Limpopo, you can travel Limpopo. But how many people travel for leisure purposes? It's not that many. Uh, and then, you know, when we got that concession, you know, of intra-provincial, we started working on you know, We need to get intra-provincial. And as you've seen, there's been a pattern in this thing. And the pattern is that something is introduced today, after two weeks, it will be changed. Or there will be a progression on what has been introduced. So after two weeks, we got into provincial travel. This is when you know, things start to open up. The hotel started to open up, the lodges started to open up. I must say, you know, when, when one is negotiating these things, you know, it, it may appear easy. These things are not easy. No, but we deal with people who are not from tourism. Some people think tourism is all about fun. And I said, yes, it is fun. But it creates jobs. You know, what is the difference between the beauty industry and tourism, you know, for, it's the same, you know, but people don't understand that the fun that other people have creates jobs for other people, or if someone wants to do, you know, hike, it may be fun, but someone else is employed because that person is hiking. So you have to convince people about the nature of tourism and what it needs to travel and why people travel. And that it creates jobs as much as one can think of it as a fun thing to do. We wish I agree it's a fun thing to do and we love our jobs and it's fun to do our jobs. We get to go to nice places. You know, we may not get paid lots of money, but hey, that's our job. We love it. So at the end of the day, uh, we get, you know, the interprovincial travel. This is when we start to see life within the value chain of tourism. The world starts to move, you know, as we call it. You know, because if we had, we had not moved around, you know, the world starts to rust. You know, you, you, you can't just sit at home. People start, you know, start to forget what needs to happen. And, uh, you know, customer service, uh, you know, it's no longer there and so forth and so on. And it creates challenges for us. So, the world starts to move, people start to move around. Uh, you know, of course, you know, government will say, but we open business travel earlier. But we do know that businesses are not traveling. And people are having meetings on Zoom. We do know that government is not traveling. Government alone, if you look at national government and provincial government, there's been around 20 billion rand on travel. 20. So that's significant. And if you look at other corporates, you know, if they're not traveling, you know, if you're an independent travel consultant, uh, you have an account here and there, there's nothing that comes in. Because remember, you need volumes. You know, to even make your salaries, you need to work hard. Uh, and people don't understand what it takes. And I always say to people, you know, when they look at the travel agencies, they think that, oh, 
you know, it's all rosy. Like, do you know how much it takes and how many volumes you have to do, you know, and how many hundred rands or 200 rands that you need to make from each transaction to make up your salary? It takes a long time. And the lack of understanding, and then people thinking that, you know, we're just making money. You know, that's one thing that, you know, we've been trying to embed in, the, in people's minds that, you know, it's not easy. You know, we know it. We've been doing it for years. Uh, you know, we love doing it. You know, quite frankly, if there was something else to do, some of us will do something else. But we love this industry. You know, we're passionate about this. So, be that it may, you know, we moved and got into, you know, interprovincial travel. The will starts to move. People start to go back to work. Although there were things that didn't make sense, you know, but at least we managed to open up the industry sooner than what it was anticipated. Had we not spoken up, we wouldn't be here today. We will be sitting at home, um, we will be shutting many properties, investors will be saying no more money, banks will say no more money, and so forth and so on. So after we moved from that, then the big battle you know, came, how do we open up international travel? And remember that the perception out there is that travel brought the virus into the country. And yes, it did. We are, we are unapologetic about that. Yes, it did. We are an interconnected world. It can't be that we think that people are not going to travel up and down. If you're South African, you're going to travel out. You know, how many of you have traveled out and got malaria or, you know, hepatitis or whatever it may be? We all move around. If it wasn't for a traveler coming in, it would have been for someone who was bringing goods into the country uh, to bring in the virus. So it would have came here anyway. So, yes, travel brought the virus, and the virus travels with people, and it gets transmitted to another person because of travel. So, we can't deny that. It is a fact of life. We are where we are, uh, and uh, we need to sort of demystify, you know, that whole thing that says, you know, it only travel. But it could have been anything else. The virus would have arrived here. Even if we were staying in some island, and we close our borders to anyone not to come in. Believe me, we need to eat and we need other things that we don't make here, so people will come. So that was one big battle to say, you know, how do we convince government that, uh, you know, international inbound travelers are not going to bring the virus because it's already here and it's going through the communities, and therefore, few tourists that come into this country pose no further risk than where we are. So that, that battle then started. Uh, we started to talk about international inbound. Mind you, this was not something that was thought of. In fact, I remember going to Parliament, um, I think it was in August, presenting to the Portfolio Committee. Uh, they just said, nah, you next year, February. And I said to the Portfolio Committee, no, it's not going to be next year, February. It's going to be this year, and it's going to be in September this year. <coughs> Then we put a date down, say, if you don't do this in September, then forget about the industry. Then, you know, once you set the date, you create that agency. If you just go and say, well, it should open at some point, at some point it's not a date. You know, it's, 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 it's an abstract kind of statement that means nothing to anyone. If you go to your investors or you go to the bank and say, you know, you want a loan, and then they say, but when are you going back to work? You say, well, at some point. You know, they're not going to give you anything. So we had to, 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 to get government to stop, you know, that whole thing of we will open eventually. Eventually is not a date. Sometime is not a date. Let's put a date down. We said September is the date to open. There's a reason why we did that. One, put a date down so everyone knows where we are. Number two, uh, we work towards the date, all of us, and we prioritize government into opening, you know, on that month. If we don't get September, we knew, we knew that at least we'd get October. If we had gone and said December, they would be like, great, we would have gotten one, January or February. So it's important to put the date and to make sure that we will pressurize, you know, accordingly. And uh, we did that, we put the date, uh, and it did in September, although we wanted this to be announced in August or earlier than that, it was announced that uh, we will open in October. Uh, but that came with its own challenges. 
because now we introduce another layer to say, well, we'll open, but we'll have the list of countries that will be allowed mm. and those that won't be allowed. So I'm saying all this so that you can understand the little battles that one needs to fight to ultimately get to the open. We did the same thing in uh, domestic travel. Oh, um, hotels can't take leisure travelers, but you can take business travelers. Yeah, but business travel then, it was less than 5%. So why would you open your hotel for one person? It doesn't make any business sense. And what's the difference between a business traveler and a leisure traveler? And why are we assuming that everyone is going to want to get out of their house and all of a sudden say, I'm going to stay in a hotel? So a lot of something that goes into that. So we had to do the same thing, fight and say, you know, fine. Then the open hotels, okay, with conditions and confusing statements. You know, that says, as an example, 50% uh, uh, of the floor space. What is a floor space? You know, things like, little things like that where you're like, okay, talk to us if you want to know our industry. Think that it may we we'll move through, come to international, oh, we're going to have a list. And we said, well, before we put up a list, talk to us. In fact, we don't need a list. Everyone is coming with their PCR test, 72 hours, as you stipulated. Whether they come from high-risk country or low-risk country, shouldn't matter. You negative, you negative. It ends there. And if should they fall sick when they're in the country, what well, we do with it as if anyone else in the country falls sick? You quarantine, you self isolate, you go to the hospital, you need to go to the hospital. Oh no, we have to come with a list. <laughs> the list has to be created because the president said there will be a list. So, as you know, two weeks ago, there was a list. And then we warned about the list because we understand the industry. We understand the booking site. We know that people don't plan, no international traveler will plan on two week cycle and say, well, today I'm going to go to South Africa, I'm going to hop on the plane, and Lufthansa is going to start that jet, and it's going to carry us to go to South Africa, and then after two weeks, if they switch, up, switch us off, well, we'll come back. It doesn't work that way. So they put up a list, and we've been fighting about this list for a while. A few days ago, well, two weeks ago, Germany, Spain, Canada, you know, they are allowed to come to South Africa, low-risk countries. So what do the Germans do? Let's book. It's going to be called in Germany. We want one more than South Africa. Ah, then they booked their tickets. You know, the ambassador of Germany went and spoke, said, you know, we're open, people are coming in. But not without confusions, though. With lots of confusion and by the way as soon as we announced two weeks ago we announced you know that germany is allowed to come there was a flight in the morning that arrived that day so i kind of wondered when did they knew about it and when did they get their negative tests uh, you know but anyway i'm not gonna I'm not gonna complain about that so that the germans are coming two weeks later we said no no no, no you high risk we can't come <sighs> then the germans are like but we booked same thing that I was talking about. The list doesn't create certainty. No one is going to book their trip to come to South Africa, provided we have the list. So you might as well say we are not open. You can't have two statements. You can't have a statement where the president is saying, you know, we want to expand the list of the country to support the growth of tourism. And then you come and you give us the list where all our source markets are the red list. They can't come. Where is the support? Where is the link? So we're in a situation now where we have the red list, although revised, you know, to about what, 23 countries? Well, there are countries there that I don't think they should be there. <laughs> and you can't quote me on this if you, if you can <laughs> I know you record. PNC. So here's the problem. So how many of you here receive tourists from Peru? <laughs> How many? In a year? Two years. Um, yeah. Stop bragging here. Yeah. <laughs> so let's do this quick mathematics, right? So Peru is on a high risk country, high, high risk list, right? 
So what? We receive ten tourists from Peru. Yeah. yeah. Why they want a higher risk? Because all you got to do, if you are to use the list, is the same. Whatever the methodology that you use, mm -hmm. one organization, let's say you say 350,000 case or 9,500 death, whatever it may be that they're using, you can't just end there. You've got to go and say, but how many people come or used to come to South Africa pre-COVID, right? So we used to get from Peru, let's say 200 people a year. And then you start to extrapolate and say, well, what does that mean? You know, per month, is it 180 people, maybe? And then you start to say, well, you know, now that we're in COVID, are you still going to get the number? You're not going to get 50 a month. So if you take the 50 people coming from Peru, of which I'm sure each one of them, before they come to the country, they do a lot of research. They want to know that, you know, they're not going to get malaria. You know, they have this African context and say, well, what other pills do I need to get? Right. Mm -hmm. You know, what injection do I need to get? What other right. yellow fever? Well, we don't have yellow fever, but all this other stuff they go in and get, why would 50 people pose a significant risk to the 58 million people that go to Woolworth and to ShopRite every day, you've got a petrol station, you've got a hike and do all this. Why would 50 people pose a significant risk? I mean, we're talking as if, sometimes I'm like, we're talking as if we're Spain, you know, where we'll get millions of tourists. We we'll only get about 2.6 million in a good year from outside of the African continent. 2.6 million. And you know what that constitutes in the tourism landscape globally? Probably 0.1% mm -hmm. of the entire tourism tour tour that travel around. It's insignificant. Even on our best years, our numbers are insignificant. Well, if you go and extrapolate the repeat visitors, point in case, UK, we get what, 430,000? 440,000 per year. Do you know that 50% of them are repeat visitors? Are coming to their houses here? Mm. So literally, you're really getting around 200,000. Mm. So you're probably not getting much of new tourists coming into the country. If you take out the non-tourist tourists, and you know what I mean by non-tourists, the ones that don't stay in your place. They stay in their houses, they've got, if you extrapolate those numbers, your figures are much smaller. The same is in Germany. You know, your figures start to get smaller. So we believe we're a significant player in the grand scheme of things, which is nice for confidence, but when it comes to runs and sense, it's not that much. So we have that challenge, we're working on it. You know, I'm confident that the list will be scrapped. I'm just not gonna tell you when, but <laughs> what's the space in the next two weeks? I am very confident that the list will be scrapped. There's just a few things that we need to work on. Uh, and we are waiting on, and I'm confident, you know, that uh, in few days to come, we should get the list scrub. Because if, if they don't scrub it, we're not going to stop. And if we're not stopping, it's frustrating for government because of issues. We raise issues at many levels of government, at network, for the social partners, many labor, communities, business, and government. That's a, uh, a discussion agenda. Uh, and it's a burning agenda that we're discussing at network level. So we will get that right. I can assure you, we will get it right. We're not going to stop until we get it right. And uh, and when I say we're not going to stop, uh, it means that uh, we're in a battle. Uh, and until this battle is finished, we're not going to stop. The war is not yet finished. There are many things that we need to sort out. As you know, the Minister of Finance cut the budget for the Department of Tourism by 40 percent, equivalent to one billion rand. This is the department that received around 2.5 billion rand. Majority of it goes to SA Tourism for marketing. So we cut one billion, you're cutting around 866 million from South African tourism budget. So it means that you're cutting the marketing budget, and you're only leaving admin costs. So how are we supposed to market the destination? I mean, talk about the industry, right? that even if you extrapolate the outflow of tourism money, those who travel overseas, versus those who come in, you still have a positive trade balance of 40 billion rand. It means that we bring in, we help government to balance its books, you know, with its creditors overseas, because we bring in 40 billion in extra cash if you calculate the outflows and the inflows. So, 
that is one aspect, you know, that, uh, you know, one would not understand why then do you cut a budget for the department that brings in money. And by the way, it's not going to just be reinstated like that. So it's going to be another fight where we need to get money so that we can position the destination properly so that you can do what you do best and you can be able to easily convince people to come to the country. If we don't get that money back, it means that you're going to have to spend more on marketing. And why are you going to get the money to spend on marketing when you've been closed for eight months? So it makes no sense. So all I'm saying is that, you know, this is where the money should be invested because, you know, the returns are visible and they're tangible. And if you look at the tourism satellite account, you can see that there's the money that comes in and you can see how much it is. Although I do believe it's more because, you know, if you look at the restaurant space, there may be money that, you know, in the informal, you know, tourism businesses, that's not being declared. So that's just, you know, one side thing. So financial assistance in terms of the budget for South African tourism is critical. Uh, financial assistance for the industry so that you can be able to access, you know, the 300 billion rand that's been put aside by government as a government guarantee loan scheme needs to be accessible. Right now it's not accessible. You know why it's not accessible? Because tourism is seen as a high-risk industry. You know why we're seen as a high-risk industry? Because we're not fully open. So the banks are saying, well, you know, you can say what you say, but you're not open. I've met with all the banks. I've met with APSA, I've met with Standard Bank, I've met with FNB, RMB, I've met with all of them. Even the international banks. They say, well, you're not open. Until such time that you're open, then we are viewed as right now with the medium risk so we need to fully open the international border stimulate demand start to see some numbers trickling in to be seen as low risk and be able to access the government guarantee loan so i'm just sharing this with you as part of another body of work that we're doing <laughs> on the side that we may not be vocal about it but that's the work that needs to happen here's another thing that's quite uh, interesting We've been talking about the e-visa for quite some time. Who amongst you have been to take it? How long does it take to get a visa? <laughs> you could blink, your visa is on your inbox. And you get to Istanbul, print your paper, here you go, stamp, stamp, off you go. Why can't you do that? Why does it, why, why, why do we, <laughs> you know it's South Africa. The world can have a world-class solution to a problem, uh, but not here. Uh, we must have a South African solution. And our solution has to be complex. And it has to be multiple patterns. But the system is there. It's on the shelf. You buy it, you implement it, that's it. Why can't we do that? Why do we have to build it from scratch? And then, we, then, then when you build it from scratch, then you've got home office saying, but I don't have enough budget. And then I don't have enough stuff. I'll give you a point in case, what's happening now. On the, on the Home Affairs Gazette, it says if you're a business traveler, you want to come to South Africa, you're a business traveler, or you want to, you're an investor, you're coming from a high-risk country, you need to send an email to apply, right? That you want to come to the country. So guess what happened? So people applied. So I called my contacts and I said, I'm getting, people are applying, but they say you're not responding. And then my contact says, yeah, we have 10,000 emails here on the same box. <laughs> and there are six people. And we can only process 50 a day. <laughs> so I'm like, um, but then why did you ask people to apply in the first place when you don't have a service level agreement to say, how soon are you going to get back to them? What's your turnaround time and so forth and so on. But that's just another example. The world has a solution. But what do we do? We must have a South African complicated solution with layers and layers where you, you don't know who you need to talk to. And it happens often, believe me. <laughs> who do you think owns the list of Irish countries? Who owns it in government? I don't know either. And I should know. You know why I don't know? It's because I've called everyone. 
And I said, are you the one who, who put together? Let's no, it's not me. <laughs> it's not me. You call the next, I'm talking about it's senior me. level, DG level. You call the next DG, are you the one who's responsible? Said, no, 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 not me. <laughs> then you go to health, are you the one who put the list? No, no, no. We just take instructions. Then who do I need to talk to? Oh, no, no, talk to Ned Jones. You have heard, you've heard of Ned Jones, right? So, so, so let me put this. I'm sharing this so that you can understand the complexity of what we do. So, so the, the stages of whether we move to stage two, one, whatever, right? This is how this thing is done. So there's what's called net joints, national joint committee. <laughs> so the the DJs or technocrats and provincial people sit there. Then they go and debate. And then when they're going to debate, they're going to debate and say, you know, should we move to level one? Should we move, should we leave it there? What should we open? What should we not open? So that first level is critical. This is what we negotiate throughout the night. You know, and then you say, but now we, we can do this because we have, we have put protocols. We can open leisure accommodation because we've done this. So we go back and forth, back and forth. Weekends, you know, we're shouting at each other. You know, we're, giving, we're feeding information from our industry into the net joint. They go and debate, right? They debate, they debate, they don't give you feedback. <laughs> then, then the information is taken to National Command Council. National Corona Command Council, where the minister sits. Then it gets debated, 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 then you get another call. But we need to refine this thing. You go and debate and debate, you spend your whole weekend putting more information and more motivations and you're writing letters, you're doing many different things. Then after you do that, then the National Command Council takes the information to cabinet. Then the cabinet debate it. Then they won't hear anything. Then that's where the politics come in and so forth and so on. Of course, it's about politics when it gets to that level. Then the president goes and announces. So when the president stands there and speaks, You've gone through the three stages. And you've been negotiating, negotiating, negotiating. Sometimes we know what's going to be said in terms of what's going to be open. We just can't say prior to the president speaks. Sometimes we're like, hmm, we did motivate, but we are 50 50 of this. Or, you know, the indications are this or they are that. So those are the three stages. So that you know that, you know, this thing goes in layers and layers and layers. Now, the complexities in government, the complexities with visas, you know, continues. We talk about the, the visa was spoken about two years ago, it's not ready. I have seen the demo. Um, it's been developed by Omar Press. But there's a, status is a big part of the development. We don't know when that's gonna be completed. The president said it's gonna be prioritized. I heard that there's no budget from the technocrats, so I don't know. So, I'll put that aside. The list of the countries, as I've said, I believe that's going to be dealt with, uh, although there may be complexity. There are certain things that we need to be careful of. And, and this is, when you negotiate with them, you're going to be careful of these things. So if we go and say, no, 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 scrub the list, they can say, yes, we'll do it. But when everyone arrives here, they must quarantine. We don't want that. So we need to be careful because you can get one and lose the other then you're in the same position. So we have to be very, very super careful and know exactly what we want uh, and make sure that you know the solutions that we get you know, are adequate for the growth of tourism. <clears throat> so that has been the challenge. And uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that we have achieved some of the things that we wanted to achieve. We have made sure that you know, the restaurants open uh, we have made sure that the hotels open. We have made sure that you can go and trade. We have made sure that you know we can be here today. It was not an easy thing to do. They would have been happy if we kept quiet. And here's the third element. Well, before the third element, you know you would have seen the, all the media blitz that we've done. Pressurizing government through media. Uh, I wrote only one letter and I said this is not going to work because you're never going to get an answer, so media works. The other element of talking to government is legal. We thought of going legal. 
we thought about it. In fact, we went as far as getting an opinion from a senior counsel. Senior, senior counsel, those people argue the silk. We went, got an opinion. You know, I got a lecture about law and the probabilities of winning and not winning. So we thought about that. And one of the things that, again, we have to be careful of is that, you know, as you have seen in this country, you go to court, then they say, well, you, you took us to court about opening domestic or international tourism. Well, we're going to wait until the court pronounces when we're going to go and argue the matter. And therefore, we're not going to touch that issue. The status quo remains. Let's say you go to, we go to court and we win the first round, right? Then tomorrow they're going to say, we are appealing. Then you wait to go to the Supreme Court. Then it will take you, what, another eight months? You go out there, remember, they're using your money as well. It's not their money. And then you wait for another eight months. So that wouldn't have worked properly, given what we wanted. So the important part about this is that we have the end goal. What is it that we want? We want the industry to open. How do we want it to open with lesser conditions, but also not to be reckless? Make sure that in whatever we do, we do it practicing protocols and we mitigate the spread of the virus. If we go this route, we're going to look at the pros and cons. Remember, it would have been quite nice if I say we're going into court. Everyone will say, yes, we are going to court. All of us, will, you will be behind me. We go to court. If I go to court and lose, you'll be like, ah, ah mm -hmm. <laughs> you didn't think about this properly. So what I'm saying is that we have to be careful. There's a strategy behind all this. We have to make sure that we get what we want out of it at the shortest space of time. And we have to know what's going to take us home, what's going to make us win, and what's going to open the industry ultimately. Fighting and not opening anything in the industry would not have served you any purpose. So we can't be blind fighters. We've got to fight with our eyes open. We've got to know the risks of you know, certain fights, and we've got to lead certain battles so that we can win the bigger ones. So it's important that in whatever we do, we strategic, and we make sure that we do it for the benefit of the industry. It's very easy to destroy the industry. And we already are suffering from COVID. The last thing we want is to further damage the industry. Now, my last point, this is very important. Government is concerned about the second wave. You would have seen the Minister of Health talking about uh, the super spreader events. He talked about, I think this morning, he talked about uh, the numbers that are increasing in Cape Town. One of the things we can do from our side as practitioners is to make sure that we practice the protocols. That's very important. I don't think we can avoid the second wave. I think the second wave will come. And this is not because tourists are here, but we don't have any tourists. The last time I checked, on August 36, we had less than 2,000 tourists that came to this country for the whole month. The problem is compliance. And it's compliance as a citizen. Are we doing what we're supposed to do to mitigate the spread of the virus? I'm probably going to do an opinion piece on sunny times. Probably. That's if they accept it. You know, about the fact that there is a lack of campaign in terms of getting people to comply. You go, you walk through the streets, you go to township, you go to suburbs, people are just not complying. And remember, the tourism engine is warm now, right? We are revving it a little bit. If we get international to come, we're going to start to book for December, January, February, March. You know, we start to build that forward book. We start to see what's going on. You know, we start to make decisions. You know, that builds the industry. The last thing we want is that, you know, when this bus is moving, the engine is warm. We are on N1. The engine gets switched off. That destroys the engine. And we know that. You can't switch off the engine when it's on high speed. And if we don't comply and do whatever it takes to mitigate the spread of the virus, we risk the engine being switched off in the middle of highway when we are already picking up the speed. 
not a good thing to do. So I'm just encouraging everyone to say, you know, in whatever we do, we need to make sure that people understand that number one, if we go to another lockdown again, that's hard. That's more than what we've been going through. It's not gonna be good for jobs. It's not gonna be good for businesses. It's not gonna be good for what we do. In fact, it's gonna be worse than the first one. Because right now, you know, we are on our last, you know, quarter time. Yeah? You know, we're using our money to run these businesses. We're, we're pouring everything into these businesses. We're on a quarter time. Some of you have mortgaged your homes. Uh, you know, some of you have sold your cars. Some of you have moved from your houses to, to smaller places. We're on quarter ten. We can't go beyond than this. And we're the ones who can who are in charge of this and can ensure that uh, you know we we get people to comply. I'm not worried about compliance in our establishment, but I think we're doing good. Can we improve? Yes, we can improve. I'm worried about Friday nights, people going out, not complying, not wearing masks, restaurants turning into nightclubs, and so forth and so on. It starts like that, then the number trickle up, and then the red button is pressed. Engine goes down. Who's the first one that's gonna be affected? It's us. We are the first ones to be closed. We are the last ones to be open. If the second spread comes in, we're going to be the first one to be closed and the last one to be open. So I'm just appealing that in whatever we do, when we when we put the signs that says you know rise of uh, the rise of admission is reserved, let's make sure that it's reserved for those that don't wear masks. They shouldn't be able to come into our establishment. And this is something that for all of us, you know, we need to manage to make sure that the engine doesn't stop. Believe me, we work hard. I've never worked this hard in my life. You know, we work hard, so we don't sleep. You know, to get certain things going. Basic things that you know yourselves, that these are basics. But they're not so basic to other people. So, you know, it's tiring when you explain the basics over and over again. So I'm just saying and appealing that in whatever we do, when we talk to our clients, we must make sure that we tell them, make sure that you take your mask, take your sanitizers, do whatever you need to do to mitigate the spread of the virus. We still want to have this event next year, you know, in better conditions, where we'll all be talking about, hey, I've picked up now, I'm in 40 or 50 percent. The occupancy rates have gone up. You know, the pricing is recovering. What we're seeing now, you know, all of you have stretched your prices by half. So Ah, so as much as you're seeing occupancy going up, we see it on the figures that ah, the income is not going up here. We're going backwards. And that's the most important part. So we're not out of the woods. People may be coming to the establishments, people may be traveling, but they're traveling on half prices, 75% off, or you know, 35, 40% off. We need to go back to the levels that we were to sustain ourselves. And I do hope that as an industry, we will pull together, hold hands for the sake of our own industry, and we will ensure that the work that we've done is not reversed. And I do hope that your support and your unwavering support will continue, because we can't do anything as a TPCSA if you don't support us. You know, we can't give you support. And we count on all those things that you say, that you know we are behind you, you know, we're going this way together and we'll prosper together. And if we do that together and we continue to do that, and we continue to hold our hands and we continue, you know, to encourage each other, you know, I do believe that we'll prosper. I do believe that the industry will come back. And I do believe there will be better days ahead uh, that will be filled with laughter and smiles. And we will be able to inspire the younger generation and ensure that, you know, they join the industry. Thank you.